This is uh, another video uh, in the Fundamentals of Electrical Circuits uh, series. Today we're going to talk about Ohm's Law and Ideal Circuit and cover a few um, power supplies and you know, current sources and voltage sources. Ohm's Law uh, was described by Simon Ohm um, and when he was uh, talking about Ohm's Law and what he wanted to talk about was um, he noticed that when electricity uh, moves through any material, he saw a relationship between voltage and current. As you, as you may recall, voltage is in units of volt and uh, units for current are amp. So he noticed that there was always proportional. As he increases the voltage, the current changed and um, vice versa. And he found that the the value, the, the divisor, uh, when, the, when voltage was divided by current, always stayed constant. And that's what we are referring these days to as resistance, which basically means um, 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 how hard is it for an electron to move through a material. And resistance um, is V over I, of, uh, uh, and is represented by um, Greek letter omega, which basically is uh, uh, units of resistance, and it stands for ohms. Sometime you may also see letter G used, and G is conductance, which is 1 over resistance, and that is I over V. And this is usually used to indicate how easy it is, is it for a current to flow through material. Now, most of the time, what we're going to do, we're going to really focus on resistance. And the way we talked about resistance is we show it as kind of a few wrinkles in, uh, in the straight line. This basically indicates is a conductor of some sort, something that can carry electrons, but it resisted. It doesn't let electrons to go through easily. So we usually say this is R. And R is a passive device. Its job it is as it resists the electrons, it uses the energy that is delivered to it and it consumes it. And the way it gets rid of it is it gets rid of it by heat. Um, since it's a passive, um, um, passive device, if you recall, passive devices are devices where if you have a plus and minus voltage, the current by definition always will flow into the positive side. So a resistor, since is one of the passive devices, it will always have, if you know the direction of the current, you know the direction of voltage and vice versa. So if I know the direction of voltage, then I know the direction of current. So, so let's go ahead and try to apply this simple concept. So if someone comes to you and draws a resistance and they'll tell you that the voltage across this resistor is 10 volts and this is a 5 ohms resistor then the question that would be asked of you is what is i well you say okay i know from the original ohms law that r is equal to v over i and we know that this equation, R equal to V over I, not only can be written that way, it can also, we can just move things around depending on what we want to find and what's given. We can either write it as this, or we can write it as this. Since in this case, they're, they're given us the resistance, they've given us the voltage, this looked like an appropriate equation to use. And if you use that V over R, then that is 10 over 5 and is equal to 2. And that's basically the Ohm's law. And the passive convention comes into play because uh, resistors are passive devices. So, so we know now that resistors are passive devices. And if you recall, passive devices are devices that consume energy. Therefore, the power is always larger than zero, so they consume. Okay. Now, just, just to complete the conversation on resistors, let's talk about power. We said that power is always V times I, and that's still true for resistors. 
but because we can apply the Ohm's law, one is we could go ahead and replace, one time we can replace VI with a V over R. If we do that, then our result is V squared over R. So that, if that's easier to use, then that's great. In another case, what we could do is replace um, V with I times R, which gives us a second variation, which is I squared R. Okay, And in both, both cases, since R is always positive, uh, zero or larger, I squared is always positive. That means the power is always positive. That means power is always bigger than zero or equal to zero, of course, but we don't care about the equal to zero because nothing is happening. Then it's always consuming. So that was based, that was uh, the resistance or the Ohm's law portion of the conversation and the passive convention we had already talked about. Now let's go ahead and change the topic a little bit. Resistors, yeah, resistors are basically, you can think about them as a long, thin wire where electricity has to move through it, depending on how long it is and how thin it is. You can think about it having higher, if it's higher, if it's longer and thinner, then it's higher resistance. If it's thicker and shorter, then it's lower resistance. But in order for something interesting to happen, we have to energize this resistor, which means we have to have sources of energy. In our terminology, we would have, we have kind of two dimension to work on. Our sources could be dependent sources, uh, or they could be independent sources. Independent sources. So that's, that's kind of one separation. Another separation that could have is there could be either a current source current source or they could be voltage source okay so it looked like at least we have four possible one we actually have more but let's let's stick with the four and see what are they are going to be well a dependent current source, a dependent current source, uh, the way we know it's dependent is because they are a diamond. I better get a smaller drawing pen. So since, so if, if, if you see a, a, um, diag the, a um, um, diamond shaped thing, you know that's a dependent source. So what does dependent source mean? Since this is a current source, we're going to use an arrow in the direction where the current is flowing. And so, so that means the current that flows through here is dependent on some other current some, or voltage some place else. So there could be like 5, for example, 5i some x someplace else, or it could be dependent on, like, say, 4vx. Either one of those are good. And they call them... Uh, for the for example, this one is going to be referred to as a current dependent current source. This would be a voltage dependent voltage source, and the independent one is not that complicated at all. We usually use a circle to say independent, and the reason they call it independent is because it's just got a value, and that's it. It doesn't care what else is happening in the circuit. Always is going to give you five amp if you say it's a five amp source or two amp or whatever you give it. So that's the independent one. If you go back over here, of course, the voltage source is represented with the direction of voltage plus and minus. If you draw it as a circle, it means it's independent, regardless of what else is happening in the world, it's going to give you six volts, and that's all. If it's a six volt source, that's all. On the other hand, you could potentially have a dependent source, a dependent source, much like dependent voltage source, much like the current source, gives you voltage, but its voltage could be dependent on some current someplace else, or it could be dependent on some voltage someplace else. By the way, the unit for these are volt, the unit for these are amp. So now, now you got a kind of a good idea of what the sources are and how how they're used. Uh, before we go too far, uh, let's go ahead and talk about all the circuits we're going to work on 
we're going to assume they're ideal circuits. So what is an ideal circuit? I mean, ideal circuit basically tells us three things are true if you have an ideal circuit. And one, one of those is that you have, um, one is that um, the electricity um, uh, is, uh, I'm sorry, the electrons, net electrons, uh, are not stored in any device. So for example, what, what do I mean by that? So let's say you have element one, you, let's say you have an element two, and you have an element three, okay? And if you recall, the current of flows, I1, is talking about the rate of the charges that are going into element one, which is if you go with the first one where we are saying that none of these devices store uh, charge but rather to just pass it through so whatever I one goes through here is gonna come out this way so all of these currents basically gonna be exactly the same so if I put I one in here I'm gonna get an I one back so that's rule number one currents in a branch current in a branch is unchanged step two basically says that if I got a piece of wire regardless of what sits in the middle like this one two as many as you want whatever voltage you have here that's exactly the same voltage you have there and you're going to have exactly at the same time so voltages are the same at either terminals that are measured so that's rule number two rule number three in an ideal circuit which sometimes is a lot fair amount is used to show that either a circuit is um, uh, is um, valid or not it basically says if i've got a device let's say we've got one that we have element one we got an element two maybe we have an element three and we got uh, here and maybe we have another one here um, four and maybe another one here five and let's say we got this what they're basically saying is that if you sum all the powers in all of these circuit, that has to be equal to zero. In other words, P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 equal to zero. So these are called, these are basically, these three laws are defined by ideal circuit and everything we're going to talk about unless we specifically say it's not an ideal circuit we are assuming it is an ideal circuit and as you notice the as you notice the sum of powers doesn't care whether the components are in series or parallel or what they always uh, add up just straight add um, and with no no um, special um, special treatment